My principal argument in this presentation is that the way we communicate our scientific discoveries in a science that is characterized by complexity and uncertainty is out of date. I'll argue that the reason why this isn't challenged has to do with mechanisms of status acquisition by individuals and institutions, which are fundamentally driven by financialization processes in education. Publication today is important because it means that you can be found on Google. The more you publish, and the more others publish and talk about your work, the easier it is to find you within the internet search engines. So I'm not any of these people, but I'm here. But the mechanism of publication has changed. In the 17th century and before, it was quite common for scientists to publish their discoveries as an anagram, which was a kind of cryptographic claim for priority of an idea. So this is Robert Hooke in 1679 making a claim for his discovery of the ideal arch. When Hooke was ready to fully publish his results, he could then solve the anagram and show that he had the solution uh, at an earlier date. Galileo did a very similar thing in claiming the phases of Venus, and there's a famous story about how Johannes Kepler was so keen to work out what Galileo was up to that he tried to solve his anagram and got it wrong, believing Galileo to be saying something about Mars rather than Venus. Publication at this time is not really about communication. It is rather about scientists claiming their status as the originator of an idea. It's with the foundation of the Royal Society in 1662, and particularly the publication of its transactions in 1665, that we see something that looks much more like our practices of publication today, including the sharing of empirical results within a community of scientists, peer review, and a democratization in the publication process. Now, it's worth thinking about the dynamics of the publication situation that we have today. So, for example, if you're an author, you have to work with an academic community who have access to the means of publishing your work. If they agree, then, of course, they will publish your work. And the status of that work is enhanced by the fact that the community that you've been engaging with approves of it. It's a, it's a kind of declaration of scarcity of publication. Quite simply, not everyone can get published within that community. Now, the author is an employee of an institution, usually a university, and the institution that employs the author also benefits from the fact that the author has had this status marker accorded to them by their academic community. So the status of the institution also increases alongside the author that means the institution can present itself as an elite institution, which is effectively a declaration of scarcity of the education which it provides. Now, this declaration is further reinforced by external agencies that rank one institution against another. These are a bit like academic credit rating agencies, and QS is probably the world leader. So prestigious publications improve institutional rankings. Like financial credit rating agencies, there is a monetary benefit to getting a good ranking. Fundamentally, this is about attracting students who in many countries now pay quite large fees and institutions clearly become more secure financially as a result. Looking at the publisher perspective, it's a similar story. But with publishers, the key metric is citations. And so a journal where the papers acquire many, many citations, increases in status, and as a result, publishers can charge a premium for that journal, and obviously publishers make more profits. Well-published authors become valuable commodities, and institutions that can afford them will try to hire authors with the highest-ranked publications. Also, highly exclusive journals are expensive, and they tend to be only available to elite institutions who have the money to pay for them. So it appears that both institutions and publishers are getting richer. The money is coming in from governments who fund research and underwrite loans and from students. Governments award research contracts on the basis of the quality of work within institutions, which it will assess according to the publications which have been produced. In the end, it all seems to come down to money. Publishers have shareholders, which they satisfy by successfully declaring the scarcity of publication. 
Meanwhile, universities are increasingly raising funds through financial instruments like bonds. The extraordinary thing is that this is happening at a time when knowledge and learning opportunities are not scarce, but more abundant than it has ever been before. But there are some fundamental questions that we have to ask. Has our technology in fact reinforced the declaration of scarcity of publication or scarcity of education? Can we use technology more effectively to overcome this? There have, of course, been some reactions to address this problem, the most famous one of which, of course, is the open access movement. Authors may sometimes pay publishers a fee for making their publications available for free. Alternatively, they may place preprints of their papers up on institutional or public repositories. Of course, in paying for publication, authors are effectively buying the possibility of increased citations. Governments are particularly keen to encourage open access because they do not want to see government research funding going into the pockets of publishers. A Robin Hood approach is to break the law and to disregard the intellectual property rights of publishers and basically make their journals publicly available. And this is something that's been done by a group in Russia who have set up a thing called Sci-Hub. But maybe there are more fundamental questions that we should ask, not least why it is that we're still so stuck with publishing in journals in the first place, particularly when our technologies allow us to do so much more. It's interesting to reflect on the transition from the 15th century to the 16th century, both in technology and in epistemology. So there were both technological shifts and epistemological shifts in technology, of course, printing meant that we moved from small to large-scale communities. Epistemologically, the shift was from Aristotelian science to empirical, reproducible experiments, and that required a large community in order for scientists to exchange their findings. The science of the Enlightenment was a science of certainty. Today, almost all our domains of science are characterized by complexity, non-linear dynamics and uncertainty. We see this complex science through the lens of information and it may be that this is an epistemological leap similar to that experienced between the 17th and 16th centuries. And we need to know how should we coordinate our understanding and action amongst these new scientific problems. If we look at the communication between scientists, the communication problem is fundamentally a coordination of expectations. And in classical science, this coordination of expectations occurs within the context of reproducible experiments and publications of results of those experiments. And all of these provide a very certain shared context or a shared set of constraints within which scientists can coordinate their understanding. Journal communication like this is also quite impersonal. So what when our science is complex and uncertain, where published results are not always reproducible and are surrounded by all kinds of contingencies? Scientists continue to communicate in the way that they did in the 17th century, but our technologies actually give us many more ways of communicating with one another. So we have video and open source tools and online learning activities. We have citizen science and social software and of course there are journals, but we also have blogs. There are new initiatives for scientists to publish their data rather than papers so that that data can be subjected to inspection by other scientists using their own data tools and algorithms. The diversity of all these different forms of communication could make scientific communication far more personal. Scientists can be more open about the multiple and diverse constraints that each of them operates within. And expectations between scientists can be coordinated by negotiating the multiple descriptions that each of them produces. So here are some questions to finish off. So why is it, in an uncertain world, do we continue to put so much emphasis on the academic journal? Shouldn't we be using the technologies that we have to teach each other about our discoveries and our theories? Shouldn't we be creatively using the full gamut of technological possibilities that are available to us? And I suppose, fundamentally, doesn't an epistemology of uncertainty require new approaches to coordinating understanding between scientists?